end our service today in the name of our triune God, which was placed on us at our baptism. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have done. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, and for his sake, he forgives you of all of your sins. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. and stationed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again. Two man, men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet the Spirit rested upon them as well. 
So they prophesied there in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since youth, protested. Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Then Moses returned to the camp with the elders of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there, now there were dwelling in Ju Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocked, saying, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea 
and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my works. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your men shall see visions, and your men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord come, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. said that he who believes in me rivers of living water shall flow from him or from them and so we who are believers in Christ have the most reason to hold the Holy Spirit in the highest esteem for what are we without him what were you and what would you still have been if it had not been for the Holy Spirit's gracious work upon you he quickened you do you know the gospel of Jesus Christ would be of no benefit to you whatsoever if it were not for the Holy Spirit? He quickened you. The Holy Spirit's the one that made you alive in Christ. Otherwise, you would not even be in the family of God today. He gave you ears to hear and the faith to believe. It is the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens the whole Christian church on earth. He gave us understanding so that we might know the truth Otherwise, we would just be as ignorant as the rest of the unbelieving world. It was He who awakened your conscience, convicting and convincing you of sin. It was He who gave you a loathing of sin and a broken heart over it and led you to repent. It was He, the Holy Spirit, who taught you to believe and made you see that glorious person who is to be believed, even the only Son, Jesus Christ. The Spirit has created in you your faith and love and hope and every grace. And there is not one single saving holy thought in your head that He did not place in there. But my dear friends, notwithstanding all that the Holy Spirit has already done for us, it, it, is it very possible that we have missed the largest part of the blessing that He is willing to give us? For he is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. So we've already come to Jesus and we have drunk from the life-giving stream. Our thirst is quenched and we are made to live in him. But I ask you this morning, is that all? Now that we are living in him and rejoicing to do so, 
have we come to the end of the matter? Is that all there is for us as Christians? Assuredly not. We have reached as far as the first exhortation of the Master when he said, let all who thirst come to me and drink. But do you think that the great majority of the church of God on earth has ever advanced to the next level? He said, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I think I'm not going beyond the truth if I say that only here and there you see some men and women just here and there who have believed up to that point of taking a sip of salvation. Their thirst is quenched, as I have said, and they live, and because Jesus lives, they shall live also. But they seem to have no health or vigor about their Christian life. You ever heard somebody say, well, I don't really care how big my mansion is in heaven. I just hope to get, get in. They can put me in a pup tent in the backyard. I think most of that is just trying to avoid hell. They don't really... It's like, how much sin can I get away with and still make heaven? Not doing all I can to make sure to please God. Paul said, let us lay aside every weight like we're trying to win something. And most of us are trying to, well, if I just barely walk across the finish line, I'll be good with that if I can just make that. Have we really advanced to the next level of rivers of living water flowing from them? They have a little life which to act upon others, but they have no energy welling up and overflowing to go streaming out of them like rivers. And so their, their wading into the river of life has satisfied them and they know nothing about waters to swim in. Like the Israelites of old, they are slow to possess all the land of promise that God wants to give them. They come, they cross the Jordan River and they sit down and say, oh, I'm tired, let's take a rest. We'll just wait here until the Lord comes. My friends, let us go and get from God all that God wants to give us. Let us set our hearts upon this, that we intend to have by God's help all the infinite goodness of God that He's ready to bestow. And let us not just be satisfied with the sip that saves, but let us go out to the river flowing out of us. It's a great pity, I think, when people so much preach the Holy Spirit's work so as to obscure the work of Christ. Certainly, we must first and foremost preach the crucified Savior to whom we must look and live. Jesus taught us Himself. He said, when the Holy Spirit is come, He will glorify Me. Jesus also taught us that it was needful for Him to return to His glorious throne because if He did not return, then He would not be able to send back the Holy Ghost to us. So, Christ's atoning work must be preeminent. The gospel is not, behold the Spirit of God, but the gospel is, behold the Lamb of God. But it is an equal pity when Christ is so preached that the Holy Spirit is ignored, as if faith in Christ prevented the necessity of the new birth. In the third chapter of John, Jesus himself taught us this, or taught to Nicodemus the doctrine Unless a man is born again of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is what we ought to do. We must take care to let both of these truths stand out most distinctly with equal prominence. They are intertwined with each other, and they are necessary for each other. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder, I believe is what Jesus taught. And these two doctrines, the atoning work of Christ, and the gracious Holy Spirit gathering the church and filling us and, and giving us the faith to believe, they're so intertwined that the Holy Spirit was not even given until Jesus had been glorified. Carefully notice from our text this morning, it says there in our gospel lesson that this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit whom those who believe in Him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. That's the way the English translation puts it. In the Greek original, the word given is not there. It is assumed. It is inserted by translator. You know how you can't translate sometimes English exactly into Spanish? And they mean the same thing, equivalents, like 
Komosayama. What does that mean? Do you all know what that means? Uh, actually, como tu nombre is, what is your name? Komosayama, which means in English, what is your name? But it actually means, what do they call you? Yame is call. So that's the Spanish equivalent, but it's not exactly the word. And so the Greek exactly doesn't have the word given. It's just assumed to be a part of it. And so the English puts it there. But I, I guess that was a good addition that some of the translations have made. But I think that statement is forcible by itself. How strong is the statement for the Holy Spirit was not yet? Of course, none of us would probably understand that to mean that the Holy Spirit was not yet existing, for He is eternal and self-existent, being most truly God, the third person of the Holy Trinity. But He was not yet in fellowship with man to the same extent, uh, same uh, full extent in which He is now since Jesus Christ is glorified. The near and dear communion of God with man, which is expressed by the indwelling of the Spirit, could not take place until the redeeming work had been done and the Redeemer had been exalted. As far as men were concerned, and the fullness of the blessing was concerned, indicated by the outflowing rivers of living water, the Spirit of God, for all intents and purposes, was not yet. Oh, you say, but was not the Spirit of God in the church in the wilderness? And as we read in the Old Testament right there, and with the saints of God in all the former ages, and I answered, certainly He was there. The Holy Spirit has always existed, as Christ has always existed. And He appeared in the Old Testament, but not incarnated, not in a human form. And the Holy Spirit was there with them. You read of the prophets and one of another gracious man or woman that the Spirit of God came upon them in the Old Testament or seized them or moved them or spoke by them, but He did not dwell in them. His operations on men were like coming and going. They were carried away by the Spirit of God and came under His power, but the Holy Spirit of God did not dwell in them. Occasionally, the sacred endowment of the Holy Spirit of God came upon them, but they did not know the communion of the Holy Spirit that we speak of today. A pastor, um, many years ago, summed it up like this. He said that the Holy Spirit appeared to men but he did not incarnate himself to man. His action was intermittent. He came and went like the dove which Noah sent out of the ark, which went to and fro, finding no resting place. While in the new gospel age he lives, he remains in the heart as the dove, his emblem, which John the Baptist saw descending and alighting upon the head of Jesus, the affianced of the soul. When I was reading this quote, I saw that word, the affianced of the soul. That's a word you don't hear very much, is it? The affianced. You know what that means? To be affianced. I can wait as long as y'all can. <laughs> Not really, I'm impatient. The affianced means to have a fiance. There's a certain way you say it, like when the man is the fiance or the woman, I think there's a, a slight difference in the, right? I'm talking to the wrong people. Uh, uh, Lutherans don't like to. Remember the color of our hair. <laughs> but anyway, this uh, pastor said the Holy Spirit was the affianced of the soul. The Spirit went off to see his betrothed, but was not yet one with her. The marriage was not consummated until Pentecost, after the glorification of Jesus. Remember how Jesus put it? He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will dwell with you and shall be in you. That Indwelling is another thing from being with us. Now remember, the Holy Spirit was with the apostles in the days that Jesus was with them, but not in the same sense in which He filled them at the day of Pentecost. It wasn't like anybody, nobody had ever heard of the Holy Spirit and He just showed up on the day of Pentecost. He was there but didn't have the same relationship as He did after Jesus was glorified. The operations of the Spirit of God before our Lord's ascension were not according to the full measure of the Gospel. But now, the Holy Spirit of God has been poured out from on high. Now He has descended, and now He resides in the midst of the church. Remember Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, which shall remain with you forever. Not coming and going, but remaining in the midst of the church. This shows how intimately the gift of the Holy Spirit is connected with our Lord Jesus Christ, 
inasmuch as in the fullest sense of his indwelling, the Holy Spirit could not be with us until Christ had been glorified. We have read, I'm pretty sure all of you have heard about this, that Jesus sends out the 70. Remember that? Sent them out two by two, preaching the gospel. And um, he had also sent out the, previously to that the 12. And I have no doubt that those 70 that went out preached with great zeal and produced much stir. But the Holy Spirit never took the trouble to preserve not even one of those sermons preached by the 70. We don't know what they said. The Holy Spirit never saved those to Holy Scripture. Not even the notes of one. I have not the slightest doubt that they were very crude and incomplete, showing more of human zeal than of divine unction, and hence they were forgotten. But no sooner had the Holy Spirit fallen, Peter's first sermon is recorded. And henceforth, after that, we have uh, frequent notes of the utterances of the apostles and deacons and evangelists. There was an enduring fullness and an overflowing of blessing out of the souls of the saints after the Lord was glorified and after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Also notice that the Holy Spirit was not given until not only after the Lord paid the price on Calvary, and not even after He was raised from the dead, but the Holy Spirit was not given until the ascension of our risen Lord to His glory. When He ascended up on high, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, that after He ascended on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, what were these gifts? These gifts that God gave to the Holy Spirit were men and women in whom the Holy Spirit dwelt, who preached the gospel to the nations. The shedding of the Holy Spirit upon the assembled disciples on that memorable day was the glorification of the risen Christ on earth. He's, they were saying, we hear these guys speaking the wonderful glories of God in our own tongues. Now, I do not know in what way the Father could have made the glory of heaven flow so effectively from the heights of Jerusalem as to come streaming down among them, among the sons of man, as by giving them the chief of all gifts, the gift of the Holy Spirit, after the Lord had risen and after the Lord had gone to His glory. With emphasis, it's emphasis, I may say of the Spirit at Pentecost that He glorified Christ by descending at such a time. And what grander celebration could there have been? Heaven was ringing with Hosanna and the earth was echoing in reply. The descending Holy Spirit is the surest testimony. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit today in our hearts, descending at Pentecost in the church today, is the surest testimony given to humanity to verify the glory of the ascended Redeemer. What do you mean by that? The Spirit of God was sent at that time as evidence of the acceptance of Jesus' atonement. Now, have any of you ever financed a vehicle over the years and you make payments as best you can <laughs> whenever you can't find a place to hide your car? <laughs> or you make monthly payments, don't you? And when you make that last payment, the lien holder usually sends you a letter of some sort of note saying your final payment has been paid, it's paid in full, here's your title. You ever got those in the mail before? Yeah. The Holy Spirit being given on the day of Pentecost is the surest evidence that God accepted the final payment of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world. Here's your title. You are now sons of God. Wasn't it God really saying, my son has finished the work and has fully entered into his glory, therefore I give you the Holy Spirit. And behold how the Holy Spirit is given to be the first fruits, the foretaste of the glory that is yet to be revealed in us. So I need no better attestation from God of the finished work of Jesus than this blazing, flaming seal of tongues of fire upon the heads of the disciples on that first Pentecost. Amen. Uh, we're not going to take up the offering uh, plate to person to person, but we're, we'll have a plate of, to leave your uh, tithes and offerings on the way out. But we will stand and sing, give thanks for the grateful heart, the offertory. <laughs>
celebrate the Lord pouring out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So we join in confessing the words of the third article of the Apostles' Creed, as well as its explanation from Luther's small catechism. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. What, what does this mean? I believe that I have my own reason or strength for the evening Jesus Christ but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he called the gifts, enlightened and sanctified the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ as well as the true In this Christian church, I may be richly forgive all my sins, and on the last day, he will bring me to know the devil, and give me true life. On this day of Pentecost, we join our hearts and voices that in our Savior's name, to God, the Holy Spirit, we pray. And again, this is a prayer which we chant to the Pentecost tone. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the coming of the Holy Spirit, we pray for a propagation of your word, asking that it may be heard in every language, bringing the good news of sins forgiven through Christ to every place. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. pray that we may be led by the Holy Spirit to do the work that God intends for us to do, bringing aid to the poor and hope to the oppressed, working for justice in our communities, and being agents of peace in our circles of relationships. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. We pray at this time for the sick, those who are shut in, all who this day are in need of our intercession, especially we remember those who are suffering or have suffered with the COVID-19 and those who have lost loved ones to uh, its infection. We pray for Madison's grandmother, Elaine Van, the Garza family, Gary Schmidt, Louisa Grotowitz, B. Yates, Reverend Rick McMillan, Jenna Ablin, Sherry Giggleman, Pastor Kelm, Bernice Bates, Karen Roll, that their prayers may be answered soon and that they may be supported by God's people with care in the name of Christ. I also need to add the name of Miss Billy Schmidt because she is at home today with two black eyes given to her by some man I won't name. But it was her doctor. She was having eyelid surgery, but I think they were closing too much. She couldn't see, so they had to pull them back some kind of way in surgery. But that's where she, that, at least that's Bill's story. <laughs> we, play, we pray blessings upon Sherry Gross and Alyssa Finnegan, that we're celebrating birthdays. And for those celebrating anniversaries this week, Lois and Johnny Caker, and Pastor and Melissa Strimple. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. President, for our Congress, and our judges here in America, and for government leaders around the world to be instilled with wisdom and patience and righteousness, so that they may govern justly, and that men and women who serve in the armed forces to maintain peace, that they be kept safe. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. right 
right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has not left us alone following his ascension to your right hand, but has kept his promise to send the Holy Spirit, whom you continue to pour out on your people by the means of grace. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have met us today with your Son's very body and blood, and have sent us from your supper with your Spirit placed on us and in us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. The Comforter has come.